What should you do if you're having new or worsening symptoms and a potential multiple sclerosis relapse? We'll talk about the signs of a relapse, what to do step by step, and the potential treatments. Please take this as general information and not medical advice as everyone's situation is unique and different providers have different styles and some may disagree with what I'm about to say. Now, just to be clear, I use the terms flare, attack, relapse, and exacerbation to mean exactly the same thing, which is new or worsening neurological symptoms due to focal inflammation in the central nervous system due to MS. Attacks tend to come on subacutely and get worse over several days, unlike a stroke, which is often very sudden in onset, or different progressive diseases, which are often very insidious over time. They tend to cause certain symptoms. For example, one common attack is optic neuritis, inflammation of the optic nerve, which typically causes pain followed by vision loss, which often involves central and color vision loss. Another common attack is transverse myelitis or inflammation of the spine, which could cause numbness or weakness of the limbs, sometimes all four limbs, sometimes just the legs, sometimes one side of the body, and sometimes even just one limb. Some other common symptoms are double vision and vertigo, and their rare attacks such as hearing loss and even seizures can be a sign of a multiple sclerosis exacerbation in rare circumstances and all sorts of other unusual usual idiosyncratic symptoms. I'm just giving a few common examples. So the first thing to do is to take note of your symptoms and when they started and how they evolved. And the second thing to do is to take note if there are any other factors that may be contributing to your symptoms. For example, was it triggered by an infection or extreme heat or exercise? And the reason that's important is the concept of a pseudo exacerbation. And this is a phenomenon when some Someone with MS has worsening symptoms, but it's not a true exacerbation. It's actually a recrudescence or re-expression of old central nervous system damage due to a stress on the body. And it can be due to exposure to high temperatures or exercise, Utah's phenomenon. For instance, someone who had optic neuritis five years ago can take a hot shower and suddenly get blurry vision or go for a jog on a hot day and suddenly get blurry vision. Is there a new inflammation of the optic nerve? No, it's just your body, which could previously compensate for the old damage, is no longer able to do so in the setting of stress. Another common cause of a pseudo exacerbation is infection, such as a urinary tract infection. So if someone has worsening of old symptoms in the setting of a known stress, like a urinary tract infection, the thing to do is typically to treat the underlying cause, for instance, antibiotics for a urinary tract infection, cooling down and resting if it's triggered by exercise, because it's very different from a true exacerbation. And this does not mean the symptoms are not real. They are real, of course. It just has a totally different cause. So try to take note, is there anything that seemed to cause the worsening of symptoms that could be a sign of a pseudo exacerbation rather than a true exacerbation that may require steroid treatment? And of course, it's possible to have both an infection and a new true exacerbation at the same time. More typically, people who have something like an infection, it tends to cause worsening of old symptoms that may have resolved, but the person is familiar with. In rare cases, someone can have totally new symptoms. For instance, I had one patient who developed endocarditis, and while he was hospitalized, he was noted to be very weak and have a lot of difficulty walking, and he ended up having MRI scans which showed lesions highly typical of multiple sclerosis, which he likely had for years, but he was somehow able to compensate for it. But in the setting of severe sepsis, the deficits became apparent. Now that's somewhat unusual. If you have totally new symptoms, it's more likely to be a true exacerbation. But let's say you have symptoms of a typical multiple sclerosis relapse with no obvious cause like infection of a pseudo exacerbation. What should you do? Well, I'll give you a few scenarios. One would be if the symptoms are very mild or unclear. Let's say you have a little bit of tingling, 
but it's not really bothering you that much. Or maybe you have tingling in your hand, but you had similar symptoms with carpal tunnel syndrome several years ago, so you're not sure it's even related to MS. Well, in that scenario, I would recommend just waiting a little bit to see how things progress. Sometimes relapses can be extremely mild and resolve spontaneously, in which case, obviously, you wouldn't need steroid treatment. That doesn't mean to blow it off completely. You may want to make an appointment with a neurologist because if you're on no disease modifying therapy or a low efficacy disease modifying therapy, even a mild relapse is significant in the long run. It shows that the disease is active for the same reason that neurologists care about new lesions on MRI scans, even if our patient is feeling completely stable, it shows the underlying inflammatory activity is there. It just doesn't require any urgent intervention. Again, if the symptoms are unclear, it may be reasonable to just wait it out a little bit. But let's say the symptoms are significant and bothering you. And this is a subjective thing. Sometimes numbness can be very uncomfortable. It can cause imbalance if it's in the lower extremities. It can be very distressing. It can be uncomfortable and painful. Someone could have optic neuritis and 2030 vision, which seems not too bad, but there's a lot of color loss and central vision loss, and it's really bothering them. And so, of course, they want treatment. And my advice would be to get an actual appointment. In modern times, we're doing a lot more virtual visits, but my personal opinion, it's strongly preferred to evaluate a multiple sclerosis relapse in person for a few reasons. One is the potential for misdiagnosis. I'll give a few examples. I had a patient with multiple sclerosis who had significant neurological deficits, but he developed sudden onset weakness on one side of the body. His symptoms were originally presumed to be related to MS, but he actually had a stroke, and this was detected on MRI scans in the hospital. And he just had two conditions. It happens all the time. Having MS doesn't prevent you from getting other neurological diseases. To give another scenario, I had a patient who had vertigo, and I was strongly convinced that she was having a multiple sclerosis exacerbation. She was very far from me. It was hard for her to come into an appointment. She ended up seeing one of my colleagues, and my colleague called me and said, I examined the patient, and she had very clear exam findings of benign positional paroxysmal vertigo. This is a middle ear disorder that's common and has absolutely nothing to do with MS and the treatment is completely different. She did not need steroids. She needed a simple repositioning maneuver. Also, in some cases, I think it is important to rule out infection or other causes. Now, let's say I have a young person with relapsing MS that comes in with pain and vision loss and has signs of optic neuritis, like a relative afferent pupillary defect on examination. I'm just going to go ahead and treat them with steroids. But let's say I have a patient that already has some degree of leg weakness and they note their weakness is a little bit worse. It can be difficult to know for certain that it's a true exacerbation unless there's a very major change in the examination. So often I would have them do at least a urinalysis to rule out urinary tract infection, a very common cause of pseudo exacerbation in MS, especially in people with significant spinal cord injury from MS prior to giving steroids, just as a precaution, because you can imagine if someone has an infection and you give steroids, which are an immunosuppressant, that could certainly make things worse. And that leads into another story. I had a patient with a different condition, not multiple sclerosis. It was neuromyelitis optica, another relapsing disease of the central nervous system. And this is someone who had a significant amount of disability and was elderly and was taking immunosuppressive drugs, and they happened to live quite far from me. And I had a phone appointment with them, and they were telling me they were worse. And I told them, you have to go to the hospital. You have to be evaluated in person. You have to have lab tests to rule out infections. And this person denied any symptoms of infections whatsoever. And they were hoping I could prescribe them high-dose steroids that would be delivered by an IV by a nurse by home health. I did not feel comfortable with this at all. I refused to prescribe the steroids. I insisted they go to the emergency room, which they did. And it turned out they were actually septic with very severe electrolyte abnormalities. But the only symptom they had 
was worsening of their existed neuromyelitis optica symptoms. They didn't have fever. They didn't have any other symptoms of infection. Uh, but she was actually quite severely ill and was treated with intravenous hydration and antibiotics and, of course, not steroids. And it's not that I'm a genius. This is basic, basic stuff. When someone has significantly worsening neurological deficits, it's strongly preferred in my evaluation to have an appointment in person. Now, some doctors would disagree with this. Certainly, if I have a young patient, maybe not on disease-modifying therapy with relapsing MS, recently diagnosed, and they tell me they have a classic symptom, highly typical of a multiple sclerosis exacerbation they've never had before, you know, I can feel very confident over the phone that they're having attack, but I still think it can be quite useful to have that exam because then you have that baseline exam documented if things change later. And I feel that I can be uh, more precise in giving people advice in the long term with disease-modifying therapies if I've actually seen and examined them. Now, ideally, you would be seen by a neurologist that knows you, that knows your situation, that's seen you before, and ideally could compare to a prior exam and use that information to give you future advice in terms of long-term treatments. But if someone's in a desperate situation, they can just go to the emergency room. If you have severe weakness and you can't get a timely appointment with a neurologist, then go ahead and go to the emergency room. They're not necessarily going to know all the latest research. They're not going to know the basic science research. and They're not going to give you long-term advice on disease-modifying therapy, but they can do a neurological exam. They can rule out a urinary tract infection or other cause of your symptoms, and they can give you steroids and contact your neurologist if necessary. Again, I would prefer to see the patient. I think I give better advice. And certainly sometimes it is a little ambiguous. Sometimes I'll see someone and maybe the examination doesn't seem that much different to me, but there's no source of infection. The patient seems to feel significantly worse. I'll go ahead and give steroids, but I won't necessarily be convinced that the disease modifying therapy is not working if they're doing well after the fact. Now to talk about the technicalities of the treatment, the standard first line treatment of a multiple sclerosis exacerbation is steroids. There are a few formulations. One of them is intravenous methylprednisolone or solumedrol, the trade name, through the IV daily for three to five days. Me personally, if someone has a mild attack, just a little bit of numbness, mild optic neuritis with pretty good vision, I may just give three days and see how they do afterwards. For more severe attacks with weakness, significant vision loss, major imbalance, I would give the five-day course daily for five days, often with an oral taper dose of steroids after that. Now, steroids are immunosuppressants. These are very high doses. The reason for that is it takes high doses to penetrate effectively through the blood-brain barrier to be effective in multiple sclerosis. So these are much higher doses than what you would take for, say, poison ivy if you took prednisone. And that's why it's generally not recommended to give steroids unless someone really has a clear significant relapse. In my opinion, if someone has a clear relapse but the symptoms are extremely mild, it may actually be reasonable to wait it out, particularly if someone is higher risk for steroids, like if they already have diabetes and hypertension, as steroids are known to worsen these conditions. The side effects of steroids are potential infections, temporary increase in blood sugar and blood pressure. The effect of steroids lasts for approximately two weeks with high dose steroids. They also irritate the stomach and can cause gastritis and in rare cases bleeding gastric ulcers which can be quite serious. Hence it's recommended to take an acid blocker such as Prilosec or Nexium at the same time during the course of the treatment and this is typically recommended for doses of prednisone, low-dose prednisone, 10 milligrams or above. For very low doses of prednisone, it may not be necessary. Now, for short courses of steroids, it has no long-term effect on the natural hypothalamic pituitary axis, and it's not necessary to give a tapering dose afterwards. This is simply done if someone has a severe symptom and they need continued treatment. However, if someone's getting steroids for a prolonged period of time, it affects your own natural body 
ability to create corticosteroids and it's necessary to taper off slowly so you don't get a steroid withdrawal syndrome. Now, even though the course of steroids may be brief, the benefits may be delayed. People may only get a little bit of improvement within five days and may improve more slowly down the line. Believe it or not, even people with quite significant multiple sclerosis attacks can make excellent recoveries over a long period of time, sometimes occurring over a period of one to two years if the attack is very, very severe. And so don't be discouraged if your symptoms aren't that much better in the first few weeks or months. If there's a little bit of improvement, I would generally consider that to be a pretty good sign. If there's no improvement whatsoever and the attack is severe, that's definitely more concerning. One other thing that I'll mention is there's an alternative regimen to solumedrol, which I actually prefer. There's a study done in Europe that was actually a randomized trial comparing intravenous methylprednisolone to the same dose of oral prednisone. And it turned out they were equally effective and they had the same risk of irritating the stomach and causing gastritis and other problems. However, the dose of prednisone to get the equivalent of 1,000 milligrams of solumedrol, the typical dose of an adult with a multiple sclerosis relapse, is 1,250 milligrams of prednisone. And this is obtained by consuming 25 50 milligram tablets. Now you take steroids in the morning because that's when you naturally have higher steroids. So you would actually take 25 tablets with a large glass of water with breakfast. And in fact, you would have to take 26 tablets because you'd have to take the acid blocker like Prilosec at the same time. And again, you could do this daily for three to five days possibly with a tapering dose thereafter coming off slowly, particularly I prefer that if someone has more significant symptoms. In my opinion, there is a psychological bias to think that IV is better, but it's definitively proven class one evidence that oral prednisone is just as effective. And that is what I recommend unless someone can't swallow the pills or they have some other objection to it. I believe them to be equally effective. And the last topic I want to discuss is severe relapses that do not get better with steroid treatment. So let's say that you have significant weakness of both legs. You receive either five days of intravenous methylprednisolone or high dose oral prednisone and there's no improvement or minimal improvement. Again, if there is improvement, I would often encourage people to be patient, do physical therapy as people may get significantly better over the time and they may not actually need additional treatment. But for very severe refractory relapses, there are other options. One of them is PLEX, plasmapheresis or apheresis. This is a procedure similar to dialysis where a procedure is done to gain access to a large vein and a filtration process removes the plasma. The plasma contains antibodies and cytokines or inflammatory proteins reducing inflammation by removing these potentially toxic factors. It's often done for five treatments, sometimes every other day, sometimes daily. It has its own potential risks such as an injury when performing the procedure to get the central line. There's also a risk of electrolyte shifts and bleeding. I do have a separate video on it if you want to take a look in the notes below. But that is a potential option and does have evidence in a randomized controlled trial against sham plasmapheresis for severe refractory multiple sclerosis relapses. Sometimes other drugs are used for severe fulminant attacks, drugs such as cytoxan or cyclophosphamide. I've even in very rare cases used intravenous methotrexate, more commonly cyclophosphamide. Some other practitioners have used drugs like ACTH, which is another strong steroid hormone, adrenocorticotropic Hormone. So there are options for people with very severe fulminant relapses, and sometimes these drugs can be very effective and people can have remarkable recoveries. But anyway, I hope the video was helpful. Have you had a multiple sclerosis relapse? Have you received steroids? What were your side effects and results? And do you have suggestions for future videos? I do listen to these, and in fact, this video is from a video suggestion. I apologize, I can't give credit because I don't remember exactly who it was, but I did in fact get the idea for this video from a comment on one of my YouTube videos. So I do look at these quite carefully and keep 
keep a list of them, even though I don't make every single video that's suggested, I do at least take a close look at them.